Olive Oatman, an exceptionally beautiful woman with captivating eyes and a unique tattoo across her chin, has her name forever etched in history. She endured a brutal journey of tragedy, survival, and transformation. In this video, we will travel back in time to witness the harrowing experiences of Olive Oatman. Olive Oatman was born on the 7th of September, 1837, in La Harpe, Illinois, to Royce and Marianne Oatman. The Oatman family belonged to the Mormon faith, which played a significant role in their lives and decisions. The family was relatively large, with Olive being one of seven children. Royce Oatman, Olive's father, was a farmer and a deeply religious man who believed in the teachings of Joseph Smith, the founder of the Latter-day Saint movement. In the early 1850s, the Oatman family, inspired by the Mormon faith and the promise of fertile land, decided to join the Great Westward Migration that characterized much of American expansion. Religious aspirations and the allure of new opportunities in the Western territories drove the move. The family aimed to reach the Mormon settlement in Utah, a journey with challenges and dangers. The Oatman family left their home in Illinois to travel to the Western territories. They joined a group of wagons to take them on a long, dangerous journey across the American frontier. The trip lasted for months and crossed tough landscapes like deserts and mountains. The wagon group included several families hoping to start new lives in the West. The American West presented a variety of harsh terrains, from arid deserts to rugged mountains. The travelers faced extreme weather conditions, including scorching heat, cold nights, and sudden storms. These conditions made travel exhausting and dangerous. The families had to carry all their supplies, including food, water, and tools. As the journey progressed, maintaining adequate supplies became increasingly difficult. The scarcity of water and food often led to hunger and dehydration. During their journey to the border of Arizona and California, tensions flared and conflict erupted within the group. Olive witnessed her parents take a stand, leading to a split. Brewster and his followers opted for the northern route, while the Oatman family chose the southern path, a decision that would prove to be tragically wrong. As the Oatman family and their group continued their journey, Olive's father, Roy, took charge but their path to a new home was tough. The land was harsh and dry, making everyone lose hope. Some wagons in their group gave up and turned back due to the tough conditions. Finally, they reached Maricopa Wells, hoping to get to the Colorado River, but trouble was waiting. At Maricopa Wells, locals warned Roy Oatman about nearby Native American tribes who fiercely protected their land. They strongly advised him to stop and not risk a dangerous encounter. Despite the warnings, Roy decided to keep going, ignoring the advice to stay safe with the rest of the group. This left Olive's family alone, facing the danger of venturing into unknown territory. As the Oatmans traversed through what is now Arizona, they encountered their first nightmare the Yavapai tribe. The Yavapai, who were known to inhabit the region, had a reputation among settlers for being fierce and hostile, a perception rooted in the frequent conflicts between Native Americans and encroaching settlers. The encounter began suspiciously enough, with the Yavapai approaching the family under the pretense of needing food, including tobacco, and acting all nice. However, tensions quickly escalated. Royce Oatman, wary but wanting to avoid conflict, gave them what he could spare. However, this gesture did not appease the Yavapai because they had evil tricks. As the conversation progressed, the atmosphere grew tense and the Yavapai's demeanor changed from request to demand. Without warning, the Yavapai attacked. 
The assault was brutal and swift. Roy Soatman, his wife Mary Ann, and four of their children were killed in the onslaught. The attack was so sudden and violent that the family had little time to react or defend themselves. The only survivors were 14-year-old Lorenzo, who was severely beaten and left for dead, and the two younger daughters, Olive, aged 14 at that time, and Mary Ann, aged 7. The immediate aftermath of the attack was a scene of devastation. The Yavapai looted the family's belongings and left the area, abandoning the bodies of their victims. Lorenzo, despite his severe injuries, managed to regain consciousness. Bleeding and in shock, he stumbled to a nearby settlement where he was taken in and cared for by other settlers. Remarkably, he survived, though he believed for a long time that his sisters had perished along with the rest of the family. Later in his life, however, he strongly believed that his sisters were still alive, and he dedicated time, money, and energy to a frantic search for them. Meanwhile, Olive and Marianne were taken captive by the Yavapai. The trauma of witnessing their family's massacre and the uncertainty of their fate weighed heavily on them. They were forcibly marched to the Yavapai village, a journey that was both physically exhausting and emotionally harrowing. Upon arriving at the Yavapai village, Olive and Marianne face a harsh, new reality. The Yavapai, although initially brutal in their capture, did not kill the girls. Instead, they were kept as captives, a common practice among some Native American tribes at the time, who sometimes integrated captives into their communities as laborers or occasionally as adopted members. The Yavapai saw potential value in the girls. They were young and could be useful to the tribe. For Olive and Mary Ann, the ordeal was terrifying. Separated from everything they knew, they had to navigate a completely foreign environment. The sisters clung to each other for support, their bond a critical source of strength as they faced their fears. The initial treatment of Olive and Mary Ann by the Yavapai was harsh. They were made to work hard, performing menial and laborious chores like fetching water and firewood from long distances. The girls were under constant supervision and had little to no freedom. Communication was difficult, as they did not understand the Yavapai language or customs, and the tribe made no effort to learn theirs. Food was scarce, and the sisters often went hungry. They were forced to adapt quickly to a new way of life, performing physically demanding and culturally foreign tasks. Olive and Mary Ann's clothing deteriorated, and they were left with minimal protection against the elements. Their daily existence was marked by fear, deprivation, and uncertainty about their future. Filled with sorrow and uncertainty, Olive Oatman had no idea her luck would change. When the Mojave people came to trade with the Yavapai, the chief's daughter, Topeka, saw how badly Olive and her sister Marianne were treated and wanted to help them. Topeka negotiated hard with the Yavapai to free the girls. At first, the Yavapai didn't want to let them go, but Topeka persisted. Finally, a deal was struck. The Yavapai got two horses, vegetables, beads, and blankets in exchange for Olive and Marianne. This trade completely changed Olive's life. After being saved by the Mojave, Olive and her sister traveled for days to reach the village. Unlike the Yavapai, the Mojave welcomed them warmly. The chief and his family cared for them and made them feel safe. Olive was grateful for their kindness and soon felt at home with the Mojave. Over time, she became part of their community and adopted their way of life. The Mojave lived in the Colorado River Valley in what is now Arizona and California. They had a distinct culture and social structure vastly different from what Olive and Marianne had known. 
Their new lives involved farming, hunting, and fishing in a semi-arid environment, which required a lot of adaptation. The Mojave family, headed by a woman named Espanio, and her husband took the sisters into their household. This adoption significantly altered the conditions of their captivity. The Mojave provided the girls with food, clothing, and a more stable environment. They were given traditional Mojave tattoos on their chins, signifying their acceptance into the tribe and, according to some interpretations, a spiritual transformation. Contrary to popular opinion, Olive was never forced to have the famous tattoo. According to Mojave tradition, their tattoos would become a powerful tool in the afterlife. When entering the land of the dead, the deceased would be recognizable to other Mojave ancestors. Slaves, on the other hand, did not bear the same tattoos. While still demanding, daily life among the Mojave offered Olive and Marianne a sense of belonging and relative security. They participated in the community's agricultural activities, such as planting and harvesting crops, and engaged in social and cultural practices. This period of their captivity, although still challenging, was marked by greater stability and the opportunity to form relationships within the Mojave community. The sisters learned the Mojave language, adopted their clothing, and participated in daily activities. They wore woven skirts made from bark and plant materials, quite different from their previous attire. They also engaged in the spiritual practices of the Mojave, which involved animistic beliefs and various rituals to honor the spirits of nature. Anthropologist Alfred L. Kroeber observed that the Mojave tribe allowed Olive Oatman to leave any time. Still, they feared the consequences of accompanying her to a nearby white settlement, fearing accusations of holding a white woman captive. Olive hesitated to leave, partly due to her poor sense of direction, but also for deeper reasons. Olive appeared content in her new life. When white railroad surveyors visited the Mojave Valley, instead of seeking their help and revealing her identity, she stayed with her adopted family. They spent a week together without Olive disclosing who she was. In the mid-1850s, a severe drought hit the region, causing food shortages that deeply affected the Mojave tribe. Olive's younger sister fell seriously ill, and despite Olive's efforts to gather food, Mary Ann sadly died of starvation. Devastated, Olive watched helplessly as her sister passed away. Traditionally, the Mojave cremated their deceased, but they made a special exception for Mary Ann. The chief's wife allowed Olive to decide what to do with her sister's remains and supported her during this difficult time. By age 19, Olive had fully embraced her life in the Mojave. She had formed bonds and felt like a part of the tribe. However, her white identity remained a potential threat. Despite her efforts to fit in, her past eventually caught up, leading to unexpected challenges. The negotiation for Olive Oatman's release was a multifaceted process influenced by several factors, including her status among the Mojave and the persistent efforts of outside parties. The first significant step toward Olive's release began when rumors of a white girl living among the Mojave reached Fort Yuma, a military outpost. These rumors were substantiated when a group of Yuma Native Americans who traded with the Mojave confirmed the presence of a white captive. The negotiations were initiated by Francisco, a Yuma Indian, who the post commander at Fort Yuma sent to negotiate Olive's release. He traveled to the Mojave village, carrying a letter from the authorities at Fort Yuma and offering trade goods in exchange for Olive's freedom. The Mojave initially hesitated, valuing Olive as a community member, but the pressure and persistent negotiations eventually led to her release. The role of the Mojave tribe in Olive Oatman's release was complex. 
The Mojave had adopted Olive and her sister Mary Ann as their own, and Olive had become integrated into their society. The tribe treated her well compared to her initial captors, the Yavapai, and she had even been given a Mojave family who took care of her. The Mojave were initially reluctant to let Olive go. They had come to regard her as part of their community, and Olive herself had developed bonds with many in the tribe. However, the Mojave leaders ultimately decided to comply with the demands for her release. This decision was influenced by multiple factors, including the potential for trade and maintaining peaceful relations with the Yuma and other tribes allied with the U.S. government. Additionally, the threat of military action from Fort Yuma may have played a part in their decision to relinquish Olive. Olive's departure from the Mojave tribe marked a poignant moment. After a challenging 20-day journey back to Fort Yuma, Topeka, who had initially rescued Olive, stayed by her side. Olive was greeted with cheers and festivities as she entered the fort, yet her return was tinged with mixed emotions. Some speculate that Olive may have left more than she revealed during her time with the Mojave. Olive Oatman's adjustment to life after captivity was challenging and filled with emotions. After being released, Olive was taken to Fort Yuma, where she was reintroduced to American society. The transition was jarring. She had spent five years living among the Mojave and had become deeply integrated into their way of life. She had to relearn English and adapt to the customs and lifestyle of white American society, which had changed significantly since she was captured. Psychologically, Olive faced significant trauma. The brutal killing of her family, the harsh early years of captivity, and the loss of her sister, Mary Ann, weighed heavily on her. The tattoos she received from Mojave, marking her chin, were permanent reminders of her past. Despite these challenges, Olive demonstrated remarkable resilience. She was eventually taken in by a foster family and worked to reintegrate into society. However, she struggled with her dual identity as a former captive and a member of American society. After Olive Oatman returned to Western society, she reconnected with her old friend, Susan Thompson. Years later, Susan revealed a startling revelation about Olive. According to Susan, Olive deeply mourned her departure from the Mojave tribe. Shockingly, Susan alleged that Olive had left behind a whole family. The details of Olive's life with the Mojave are often unclear, but Susan insisted that Olive had been married and had two sons. Despite these claims, Olive publicly refuted rumors suggesting she had been romantically involved with a Mojave man. The story of her release captivated the nation, and upon her return, Olive found herself at the center of intense public interest. She was reunited with her brother, Lorenzo, who had miraculously survived the initial attack by the Yavapai tribe and had never stopped searching for his sisters. The public and media reaction to Olive Oatman's story was intense and often sensationalized. Her unique appearance, marked by the Mojave tattoos and the dramatic nature of her experiences, captivated the American public. Newspapers and magazines published numerous articles about her captivity and release often exaggerating details to make the story more sensational. Olive's story was further popularized by a book written by Royal B. Stratton, Life Among the Indians, which was published in 1857. Based on Olive's experiences, Stratton's account became a bestseller and solidified her place in American folklore. The book portrays Olive as a tragic heroine, emphasizing her suffering and resilience. Olive Oatman's real-life experiences with the Mojave tribe were quite different from how they were portrayed in Lorenzo Stratton's book. While Olive had chosen to live in the Mojave, the book 
painted a dramatic and distorted picture. It claimed Olive and her sister were held against their will, which likely wasn't entirely true. This exaggerated story was meant to grab readers' attention and sell more books. In the book, Olive described the Mojave people as savage and cruel masters who forced tattoos on her face, which symbolized acceptance into their tribe. This portrayal was misleading and unfair to the Mojave, distorting their true culture and traditions. Despite these inaccuracies, Stratton's book became successful, selling 30,000 copies. The money Olive and her siblings earned from it changed their lives, allowing Olive and her brother Lorenzo to attend university. Olive, in turn, played along with these distortions, contributing to a portrayal that misrepresented the Mojave people as brutal and oppressive masters. She claimed her facial tattoos, which were marks of adoption and acceptance into the tribe, symbolized enslavement and disfigurement. Olive's tale of survival quickly became a public sensation. Encouraged to share her experiences, she began giving lectures nationwide, often alongside her brother. These talks drew large crowds eager to hear firsthand about her ordeal and life among the Yavapai and Mojave tribes. While the book brought financial benefits to Olive's family, it also reinforced negative stereotypes about Native Americans. It's a reminder of how storytelling can sometimes prioritize drama over truth, affecting how history is understood and remembered. Olive Oatman holds a unique place in history for several reasons. She was the first white American woman to be tattooed, a distinctive mark of her time with the Mojave tribe. But that wasn't her only first. By promoting a book about her life and speaking to audiences, Olive became one of America's earliest female public speakers. This was when the idea of women speaking out publicly was still new, and her involvement unintentionally linked her to the budding feminist movement. However, the book about her, written by Royal B. Stratton, sometimes told the full truth. It often exaggerated and sensationalized her experiences, making it hard to separate fact from fiction. Olive had to recount her harrowing story repeatedly, which took a toll on her over time. While her brother Lorenzo eventually stopped telling his side of the story, Olive continued sharing hers for about six years before she had to step back. In 1865, Olive married John Fairchild, a wealthy cattleman from Texas. This marriage gave Olive the stability and security she had long yearned for. The couple settled in Sherman, Texas, where they lived a relatively quiet life compared to her tumultuous years. Before starting her new life with her husband, John, Olive made a dramatic break from her past. John didn't like her former collaborator, Stratton, and burned as many copies of Stratton's book as possible. He also convinced Olive to cut ties with Stratton, who was not invited to their wedding, because he had taken advantage of Olive when she needed money. Despite her new beginning, Olive's traumatic past still haunted her. After cutting ties with Stratton, she rarely talked about her time with the Mojave people and often wore a veil to hide her face. She became very private and withdrawn, struggling with deep emotional pain from her early losses. Olive faced serious depression and even had a nervous breakdown, leading her to seek various treatments, including a trip to a medical spa in Canada. However, nothing could fully heal her. Her difficult experiences motivated Olive to focus on charity work, especially with orphans. This work reflected her feelings of loss and desire to help those who had suffered like she had. In her later years, Olive had managed to build a life of relative comfort and stability. After marrying John Fairchild in 1865, she settled into a life that sharply contrasted her earlier experiences. 
John was a successful rancher, and together, they lived in a large Victorian mansion. Olive did not need to work, and they enjoyed financial security. They adopted a little girl named Mary Elizabeth, whom Olive lovingly raised, providing her with the stable and nurturing childhood she had missed. Despite the appearance of prosperity and peace, Olive's past continued to haunt her. She rarely spoke about her years with the Mojave people, and she often wore a veil to cover her distinctive facial tattoos, symbols of her adoption into the Mojave tribe. The emotional scars from her early traumas, including the massacre of her family and her years in captivity, never fully healed. Olive suffered from depressive episodes and emotional distress throughout her life. Despite her prosperous life, rumors and speculation about Olive's past persisted. One particular rumor falsely claimed that Olive spent her final days in a mental asylum. In reality, it was her former collaborator Stratton, who suffered from hereditary insanity and spent time institutionalized. The death of her brother Lorenzo in 1901 was a significant blow to Olive. Lorenzo had been her sole surviving family member after the brutal Yavapai attack that claimed the lives of their parents and siblings. His survival and eventual reunion had been a source of great comfort and strength for Olive. Lorenzo's passing left her feeling deeply isolated, as he had been a crucial connection to her family and her past. This loss further compounded her emotional struggles, contributing to her declining health. In the months following Lorenzo's death, Olive's health continued to deteriorate. The cumulative effects of her lifelong emotional turmoil and recent grief were evident. Despite living in a supportive environment with her husband and adopted daughter, the psychological and physical impacts of her experiences were profound. In March 2019-03, Olive Oatman succumbed to a heart attack. Her death was a quiet end to a tumultuous life. She passed away in Sherman, Texas, leaving behind a legacy that would be remembered and analyzed for generations. After Olive Oatman died, many books, articles, and studies were written about her life. These works tried to clarify what happened to her and put her story in the context of history. Olive's story helps us understand what life was like for frontier settlers, the relationships between Native Americans and European Americans, and how people deal with trauma and hardship. Kindly share your thoughts in the comments below. Also, support our channel by giving us a like and hitting the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.